Samrasamim Maharaj. And uh, blessings to have His Holiness Vatsar Samrasam. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Okay, Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna. So, shall we begin? Please, Maharaj, please, yes. Okay. You want me to do Jai Radha Madhava first? Or? Yes, Maharaj. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Gopi Janavallabha Giri Varadhari Jai Gopi Janavallabha Giri Varadhari Yashodanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashodanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Punja Bihari Jayam Vishnupad Paramhansa Paribraja Kachari Ashto Tarasat. His divine grace Abhay Charanaravinda Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Ananta Koti Vaishnava Vrinda Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Gokulananda Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Sham Sundar Lalita Vishakha Ki Jai. Shri Krishna Balarama Ki Jai. Shri La Prabhupada Ki Jai. Granthraj Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Nitai Gaur Premanande. Samaved Bhaktavrinda Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories, all glories, all glories to Sri Guru and Gauranga. Om Jnana Timiranda Sipyana Anjana Shalakaya Shakshurun Militam Yenatasmai Sri Guru Venamaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yenaputale Swayam Rupa Kadam Ahyam Tadati Svapadam Tikam Bande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yutapada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahakanda Rakunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Satvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahakanda Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinagane Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakal Patarukhyascha Kripasin Dubhya Evacha Patitanam Bhavanetyo Vishnavetyo Namo Namah Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, 
हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू बी विथ ऑल ऑफ यू फ्रॉम इस्कॉन बॉस्टन दिस इज द फर्स्ट टाइम आई बिलीव आई एम virtually or even physically uh with all of you uh i have never had the good fortune of coming to the boston yatra so i'm very happy that i had this opportunity i do hope that all of you there are well and safe i do not know how the pandemic is in your part of the world right now but in any case i hope that you are all keeping well and that you are also utilizing this opportunity to progress in your krishna consciousness i was asked to speak on the subject of teachings of prahlad maharaj prahlad is one of the greatest devotees of all time you know it is common in ordinary discourse to speak of people who are best all time some all time best footballers or all time best musicians or all time best whatever so one can also speak in terms truly speak in terms of all time best devotees there are many categories of course because we are speaking of a time frame that is so vast and the number of devotees is so large that when we speak of best devotees we don't speak of just one or two and of course except shrimati radharani uh, but generally we speak of a large number of devotees but prahlad maharaj's name is way up there and the bhagavatam also says that whenever there are discussions about devotional service in the higher planets invariably the name of prahlad maharaj figures there so prahlad is a very very important devotee a pure devotee and his example his life and his teachings are therefore very important for us much of the seventh canto of the shrimad bhagavatam is devoted to the past time of prahlad maharaj the first few chapters are more like an introductory background uh, of prahlad maharaj at the end of the fourth chapter shukadev goswami uh, actually narad muni and shukadev goswami repeats that glorifies prahlad maharaj's devotion which is unprecedented which is uh, extraordinary a very spontaneous and natural devotion for the supreme lord and then from the fifth chapter onwards we see at various points over the next six chapters that is chapters 5 through 10 at various points prahlad maharaj speaks now prahlad maharaj speaks uh one in terms of conversations when he's asked some question and he responds and then another part is when he actually gives instructions and the third part is when he offers prayers to the supreme lord but every time a pure devotee like prahlad speaks it's an instruction it's a teaching for all of us ordinary devotees or aspiring devotees so what i will do is i will pick out uh, the portions which in which prahlad maharaj has spoken and we take that as the teachings of prahlad maharaj although in a limited sense Uh, when we speak of teachings of prahlad maharaj one could also speak about chapter 6 of the seventh canto where prahlad instructs his devotee friends and also the next chapter but i would like to have a little broader understanding of prahlad maharaj's teachings and consider all the times that he has spoken in the seventh canto from chapters 5 through 10 so i have divided uh prahlad maharaj's speeches some are very brief just one verse or two three verses and some are much longer i have divided uh this into six sections 
The first is when um, Hiranyakashipu, the father of Prahlad, asks Prahlad the question of what he learned at school. When the reply is not uh, pleasing to Hiranyakashipu, he admonishes the teachers of the boy and asks them to, ask them to rectify the situation. Then back in the Gurukul, uh, the teachers ask Prahlad where he has learned this from. And then Prahlad responds. So that's the second section. After the teachers have attempted to teach Prahlad what they think is the best knowledge, which is essentially materialistic knowledge, politics, soci sociology, economics, and military warfare, or whatever else. Um, so then they bring the child back to Hiranyakashipu. And Hiranyakashipu again asks Prahlad about what he has learned in school, in the Gurukul. So then Prahlad again speaks some very, very important verses. Now, at this time, um, of course, Prahlad speaks some very, very important verses and uh, uh, Hiranyakashipu is enraged and he throws him off his lap and the teachers uh, again try to um, teach him many, many lessons. Uh, Prahlad, he goes through the motions of these studies, but he's not really interested. He takes advantage of the recess, the breaks in between the classes in the Gurukul and instructs his uh, classmates in Krishna consciousness. So that's the fourth section. And then uh, when this continues for a while, uh, ultimately Hiranyakashipu becomes enraged. Uh, he tries to kill Prahlad in many ways, but Prahlad's is untouched. To use the cliched expression, Hiranyakashipu is not even able to harm a hair on the body of Prahlad. And then he, in his fury and frustration, Hiranyakashipu asks Prahlad where he has got this fearlessness uh, and impudence from, and his strength, where has his strength come from? And Prahlad gives a reply, that's the fifth section. And finally, the sixth section is the prayers that Prahlad offers to Lord Narsingadev in Chaitanya's And then also the response to uh, what uh, the Lord, Supreme Lord Narsingadev says. These are essentially the six sections. Um, so all of these, I would say, constitute uh, the teachings of Prahlad. Now, naturally, uh, as we can understand, the teachings are quite vast. There are many, many verses. So it will not be possible in the course of an hour or whatever is remaining of that now to describe in detail. So I will just go over an outline of what Prahlad Maharaj has spoken, touching on the important points. And I will recite only those verses which Srila Prabhupada quoted often which is maybe not more than seven or eight or 10 verses from this, uh, which are ex especially important. So let's begin our summarization of the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj. So the first time that uh, Hiranyakashipu called Prahlad to know about what he had learned at school was an eventful thing because Hiranyakashipu being like any other fond father, whether materialistic or not, but Parents are generally fond of their children. So he, he called him, made him sit on his lap and showered affection upon him. And in great anticipation, expecting to hear all sorts of materialistic replies, uh, asked him what he had learned at school. Now, Prahlad Maharaj was a devotee. And as we will see later, he was a born devotee. Yes, generally, uh, when we speak of, uh, you know, someone who's ex exceptionally talented in any field, whether it is music or sports or leadership or anything, uh, we generally use the expression that such and such person is a born musician or he's a born leader. So uh, one can speak also in terms of born devotee, and that is a topic in itself, actually. Uh, but nevertheless, Prahlad was a born devotee for reasons that we will see in the course 
uh, of our discussion today. So anyway, so Prahlad replied, Tat sadh manye suravarya dehi naam Sada samud vitna dhyata sat karahat Hitvatma patam grihamanta kupam banam gato yad harim ashrayeta So this Sanskrit verse really means it, it is actually a description of the nature of the material body and the material world and it describes how there is actually no happiness in anything pertaining to the body and therefore one must take shelter of, of Lord Krishna's lotus feet by going into the forest. So that's sadhu manye. Uh, sadhu, I think it is appropriate, oh my father, or oh best amongst the demoniac personalities, I think it is really appropriate that sadhu manye asura varya dehinam sada samudvitma dhyat asat krahat that a person who is constantly afflicted by material anxieties due to false identification with the material body and especially having been, having been living in a place which is devoid of spiritual culture, uh, one should leave such an atmosphere and go to the forest. Vanam gato, gataha, that one should go to the forest Yad Harim Ashrayeta and take Ashraya or shelter of Lord Hari. Hitva, one should give up. Atma Patam, that place where there is no spiritual culture. Griham Antha Kupam, especially all sorts of family life uh, or materialistic living where there is actually no happiness. Antha Kupam refers to that well which is dry, which has no water. It's only a semblance. It only gives a semblance of some hope that there may be water, but when, when one actually goes there, one sees that there is no water there. So one becomes disheartened, disillusioned, and frustrated. So uh, for one who's absorbed in that which is false, asat karhat, when one has accepted something that is false, then that naturally gives rise to anxiety. One's mind is always disturbed when one takes shelter of uh, illusion or falsehood. Now, Hiranyakashipu is not so much annoyed, but he's amused. You know, where has this little child heard all this from? All this talk of devotion and taking shelter of Krishna or Vishnu. And Hiranyakashipu considered Vishnu to be his, his arch enemy. So he didn't get so angry at that time, but definitely he was concerned. How is it that my, in this den of materialists, in the headquarters of materialistic people, of demoniac people, I, the chief of the demons, am witnessing my son, who's only five years old, speak of the glories of serving my enemy. So he thought this is just like the childish blabber, you know, that... Many times children just speak like that. So he told his, uh, told the teachers of Prahlad, Shanda and Amarka, who were the sons of his own uh, ritualistic guru, Shukracharya, that you just ensure that no devotees come in disguise and pollute the consciousness of my son. So the students or the teachers of the child, they took away uh, Prahlad to the Gurukul. So this was the first section. And here in this section of the first section of the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad speaks only one verse. But that is also a very, very important verse. He has summarized the whole process of all, the whole Krishna conscious philosophy uh, in this one verse. So once the teachers are back with Prahlad in the Gurukul, they're very concerned because they haven't taught any of this to Prahlad. So how is it that Prahlad has learned all this? So very diplomatically, they try to kind of speak sweet words to Prahlad and try to get an answer from him. And they said, Prahlad, uh, you know, you're not speaking like the other children. The other children don't speak things like this. So where have you learned all this from about devotional service to Vishnu? Has it, is it coming from you or have you learned it from our enemies? So now Prahlad begins speaking the second part of his teachings as given in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So he begins by saying, my dear teachers, 
First of all, I would like to offer my obeisances to the Supreme Lord, by whose uh, external illusory potency, Maya, the conditioned living entity distinguishes between a friend and an enemy. Actually, there is no such distinction. We are all equal in the eyes of the Supreme Lord. So one should become a devotee of the Supreme Lord. Then one will be able to rise beyond this artificial duality of friend and enemy. When one actually becomes a devotee of Lord Krishna, then Lord Krishna becomes pleased with us. And at that time, one becomes a Pandita. Pandit means one who is truly learned. And then one rises above making such distinctions as friend and enemy and oneself. One considers everyone to be equal to oneself. One understands that one is actually part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Then Prahlad goes on to say that one who actually makes such distinctions of friend, enemy, etc., then such a person cannot understand the super soul, the Supreme Lord who is seated in the heart. So it is the same Lord in the heart, my dear teachers, who has given me the intelligence to side with your so-called enemies. So in this way, in this section, in this part of the second section of the teachings, uh, Prahlad actually makes a very important point about uh, the duality of friends and enemies. The whole world and the history of the world is full of such events based upon making such artificial distinctions, creating this artificial duality of friends and enemies. Actually, who is our real friend? Who is our real enemy? This is all an illusion. We are all in ignorance because of being separated from Krishna in our consciousness. But Prahlad is not so separated. Prahlad does not make any such distinctions. So then in the final verse of this uh, section, Prahlad explains that I'm helpless. It's not that I'm deliberately saying this out of some plan or something like that. It is just that I have no independence. I'm helplessly attracted to Krishna. Just as an iron, a piece of iron is attracted to uh, a magnet. So it's a spontaneous, natural attraction. So just as an iron piece is attracted to a magnet, my consciousness is spontaneously attracted to Krishna. So this is a very important teaching for us. So uh, we all know that when a piece of iron is rusted, it doesn't get attracted to a magnet. Although in its natural pure condition, the piece of iron will spontaneously be attracted to the magnet. The only thing that prevents such attraction is uh, rust. So similarly, the pure soul is spontaneously and naturally constitutionally attracted to Krishna. It is only that the rust of lust, the rust, the, the rust of uh, separate mentality, a mentality of uh, seeing oneself separate from Krishna, a mentality of wanting to be independent of Krishna, a mentality of, of false pride in which we want to be enjoy as ourselves. It is only such a false mentality that creates this rust, so-called rust, which prevents our consciousness from being attracted to Krishna. So a very useful lesson here. So this is the second part of the teachings of uh, Prahlad. Now the teachers hear this, they become very distressed and angry about this. They try to discipline him, reprimand him in many ways, and they continue their teachings of politics and economics and so on, and, but to no avail. They think they have made some progress. Because Prahlad used to sit in his class and simply hear the lectures and he didn't give any indication that he didn't agree with what the teachers were saying. So the teachers assume that Prahlad had understood and agreed with what they had taught. So this time in a more positive and hopeful frame of mind, uh, they once again took uh, Prahlad to Hiranyakashipu, Prahlad's father. And, and Hiranyakashipu once again with great hope 
made Prahlad sit on his lap and asked him, so my dear child, what have you learned at school? What is the best thing that you have learned at school? <clears throat> and Prahlad launches into his most famous teaching, that most famous verse, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Pad, Sevanam, Archanam, Mandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmanivedanam. And the next verse, which is Iti Pun Sarpita Vishnu Bhaktis Chen Navalakshana Kriyata Bhagavat Yadhatan Manye Dita Muttamam. So these two verses are very important, in which Prahlad actually explains to his father the topmost learning, Adhitam Uttamam. Adhitam means learning. Uttamam means the topmost or the best. Because after all, that's the question that Hiranyakashipu had asked him. What is the best thing that you learned at school? Now, even though this was not something that he had learned from his teachers, but nevertheless, this was the topmost learning. Therefore, Prahlad considered it appropriate to instruct his father in what the topmost learning was. Because he knew that his father and all his materialistic friends thought of topmost learning being uh, things like accumulating wealth and enjoying the senses to the maximum and so on. But Prahlad's conception of the topmost learning was quite the opposite. So he said, my dear father, <clears throat> there is this ninefold process of devotional service to Lord Vishnu, to nobody else but to Lord Vishnu or Krishna. And it consists of Shravanam, hearing about Krishna, Kirtanam, chanting about Krishna, Smaranam, remembering Krishna, <clears throat> Padasevanam, serving the lotus feet of Krishna, Archanam, worshipping the deity of Krishna, Vandanam, offering prayers to Krishna, Dasyam Sakyam Atma Nivedanam, serving Krishna as a servant, being his friend and completely surrendering everything to him. So, Iti Punsa Arpita Vishnu Bhaktis Chan Namalakshana. So, these nine types of devotional service to Krishna, in my opinion, O oh, oh, oh my father, these nine constitute the highest learning when they are performed directly or uh, completely. Kriyata Bhagavati Adha. Kriyata means when they are performed. Bhagavati means unto Bhagavan or the Supreme Lord. Adha means directly or completely. So Prahlad in this important, in these two verses, tells us what is the highest learning, the highest education. Again, a very important concept. The highest learning is not to become uh, very scholarly in economics or political science or in physics or you know, engineering or whatever it is. The highest learning from a spiritual point of view is actually the process of completely performed, uh, perfectly performed devotional service. Now, this time Hiranyakashipu becomes annoyed. He pushes Prahlad off his lap in disgust. And he asks, he asks, he calls the teachers and said, what on earth is going on? What have you taught my son? How dare you do this? So the, the teachers are trembling with fear because they know how powerful and cruel Hiranyakashipu is. So they, they uh, plead complete ignorance <clears throat> of <clears throat> Prahlad's devotional inclination. And they said, Oh my Lord, Hiranyakashipu, we have nothing to do with whatever Prahlad is speaking. We have been teaching the routine demoniac principles or materialistic principles of economics, politics, etc. So we have no clue how Prahlad is speaking these things and where he has learned all this from. So then Hiranyakashipu turns to Prahlad once again. And he says, so Prahlad, uh, if you haven't learned this from your teachers, then where have you learned this from? Now, Prahlad, uh, we are still in the third section of the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj. So Prahlad now, in the next three verses, gives a summary of the nature of materialistic persons 
of their consciousness, of their activities, and how it is that they cannot understand Krishna. And because of their being in such a frame of mind, they suffer a lot in the material world. And it is only by serving Vaishnavas, the devotees of Krishna, that they can actually make a permanent solution to this. It is by getting the mercy of the Vaishnavas, of the devotees, that one can understand Krishna, begin serving Krishna, and thus make a perfect solution to the problems of life. <clears throat> So these three verses are also very important. The first verse, and Prabhupada quoted these three verses many times. The first one is Matirna Krishna Paratasvatova Mitho Dipadyat Krahvratana Adanta Gobhir Vishatam Tamisram Punha Punha Charvita Charvanana. In this verse, Prahlad explains to his father Hiranyakashipu that there are some people who never get it. Get it, get what? Get the idea of Krishna consciousness. Whatever they may do, uh, matihi na krishne. Mati means intelligence or consciousness. So there are some people whose mati or Krishna can never be dovetailed in Krishna's service. They can never become Krishna conscious. So this Krishna mati, is Krishna consciousness. And this is the ultimate gift that we can have. Whenever Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to uh, bless anyone, he would always say, Krishna Mati Rastu. May your intelligence uh, reside in Krishna. In other words, may you be Krishna conscious. So what Prahlad Maharaj is saying here is that there are some people who will never become Krishna conscious either by their own efforts or by the efforts of others or by a combination of the two. Matirne Krishna parataha svatova. Parataha means by the efforts of others. Svataha means by one's own efforts. Mitho bhipadyet or by the combined efforts of oneself and others. Why not? Because they are griha vratana, griha vrata. They have taken a vow. Griha literally means the house. But it, it basically indicates a materialistic uh, or enjoying spirit. So they say because of their, they have taken a kind of a vow that they will uh, try to enjoy this world in, in all circumstances by hook or by crook. And they, have, they are greatly determined despite so many obstacles and failures and disappointments. They want to continue to attempt to enjoy this material world. Therefore, actually, they will never be able to become Krishna conscious. Adanta Gobhir. And they're trying to enjoy their senses to the maximum. Vishatam Tamishram. Therefore, they will go towards hellish conditions of life. Punha Punas Charvita Charvana Nam. Because the enjoyment of this world is not something unique. It's not something unprecedented. Uh, living entities in this world have enjoyed their senses from time immemorial. In every species of life, it has been going on. And then the next verse that Prahlad says is, Nate vidhu svartha gatim hi vishnum durashaya ye bahir arthamalinaha. So, he said, Andhaya thandirupaniya manas te pisha tantriyam urudhami pattaha. So, he says, uh, such materialistic people they do not know. Na te viduhu. Swartha. Swartha means the real benefit for oneself. Sva means self. Artha means benefit. Because they do not understand what the word sva or self means, they're in the bodily concept of life. So they imagine that self means the body. Therefore, they only think in, in terms of the bodily concept of life. So they, such materialistically inclined people do not know that the real goal of life is to serve Lord Vishnu or Krishna. Nate vidu swartha gatim hi Vishnu. Our gati, our destination, our main activity should be to serve Krishna. And why do they uh, uh, not understand that Krishna or Vishnu is the ultimate? They, they do not understand it because 
they are so absorbed in other desires. Nate vidu swartha kathim vishnu durashaya. They have all sorts of dura or bad asha or desires. Ye bahir artha maninaha. And they consider the objects of this world to be of great value. And they think, therefore, that the acquisition of such material objects and the enjoying of such material objects in this world constitutes real happiness. So that is called durasha, bad desire. So durasha ya ye bahir arthamanina. And even the so-called leaders of this world who are not spiritually educated, they are spiritually blind. And they lead the common population, which is innocent and also ignorant and spiritually blind. So when the blind lead the blind, uh, there is every chance that they will fall into a ditch. So uh, they don't understand that all the living entities in this material world are not free. They are tightly bound by the ropes of the laws of material nature. Material nature is always under the control of Lord Krishna. But these laws of material nature keep the living entities tightly bound in their grip. So there is actually no freedom, no independence. It is only an illusory conception that we are independent or free. And then he goes on to say the next verse, which is then what is the solution for this? The solution is to take shelter of the devotees of the Lord. Naisha matistava durukramangrim sprishat anartha pagamo yadarthaha mahi yasam pad rajo bishekam mishkin chananam na vrini tayavat. He says, Na esham, of all these people, matihi, their consciousness or their intelligence will not change till such time as they smear the dust of the lotus feet of the great devotees of the Lord, who are devoid of all materialistic desires. It is only after they have smeared their body with, with the dust of the lotus feet of such great personalities that they will understand or they will be inclined towards the service of the lotus feet of Urukrama another name of Lord Krishna, one who performs many valorous or extraordinary acts. So, Pad Rajaha. Rajaha means dust. Pad means the feet. Abhishekam means to, you know, smear yourself with it. So, Mahiyasam. Nishkinchanana. Nishkinchana is one who has no materialistic inclination. So, such great souls are very rare. So, if one can smear the dust from the lotus feet of these great souls, then that inclination to serve Krishna, that Krishna Mati, uh, will be aroused. One should understand this both literally, but more importantly, in terms of what the import of this statement is. It's not just that one should take it very cheaply or casually and just take the dust and smear it and think that one is now one has now become perfect. No, we may do that, that's fine. But uh, the real meaning of smearing the dust of the lotus feet of devotees on our bodies is to follow their instructions, to be submissive, to subordinate one's, oneself to them, to follow their instructions. And in this way, when one follows the instructions of the devotees of the Lord, then one gets the key to come out of this room in which we are, the locked room of material existence, one enters into an air, a universe of great happiness, of the happiness of devotional service to the Lord. So anyway, uh, now Hiranyakashipu is really infuriated and he's saying this is too much. Yes, it's the last straw, so to speak. Now he orders that um, Prahlad should be killed. So despite all the efforts of Hiranyakashipu's soldiers and even Hiranyakashipu himself, uh, Prahlad is not harmed even in the slightest. He's thrown from the hilltops, he's thrown into a pit of poisonous snakes, he's thrown under the feet 
of uh, intoxicated elephants. He's thrown into fire, into an ocean and so on, but he is attacked with weapons, but Prahlad is not harmed in the slightest. So anyway, life goes on and Hiranyakashipu gets increasingly anxious and fearful. And he's quite bewildered about what it is that is protecting Prahlad. Hiranyakashipu is so powerful that even the demigods tremble when Hiranyakashipu even as much as raises his eyebrows. And here is his own little five-year-old son who is uh, displaying extraordinary insubordination. He's refusing to follow his orders. Actually, uh, a joke that I like to make in this context is that, and those of you who are parents will probably uh, will appreciate this, that there is a reason that Krishna has produced children in this world, and that is to destroy the ego of the parents, because it's very hard to get children to do what you want them to do. So in any case, if, a, if a, such a powerful person as Hiranyakashipu could not succeed, what about us ordinary souls who are not uh, powerful like Hiranyakashipu? So anyway, life went on and on. And meanwhile, Shanda and Amarka, the teachers of Prahlad, were trying their level best to continue teaching Prahlad Maharaj and the other friends of his. Uh, but Prahlad, so now we come to the fourth section of the teachings of Prahlad. And this is his teachings to his schoolmates. So this is in two chapters, chapter six, which is titled the instruction to the schoolmates and the seventh chapter, which is what Prahlad learned in the womb. So in the very first chapter, uh, in, in the first sixth chapter, uh, Prahlad begins his instructions to his classmates. This would happen when the teachers would go away uh, in the recess and the boys would all gather to play because children by nature are frivolous. So they engage in a lot of play. Uh, so krida sakta hai. So it is the nature of the balyavastha or the stage of childhood that one likes to play. So the children were fond of playing, but Prahlad gathered them together and said, let's not indulge in these fruit, frivolous activities. Let's just uh, talk of Krishna consciousness. So because they loved Prahlad so much and respected him so much, they all sat around him. And Prahlad began his instructions. The famous verse that Prabhupada quoted many times, Kaumara Achare Pragyo Dharman Bhagavata Abhya Durlabham Manusham Janma Tadapya Dhruvam Arthadam. In this verse and the following few verses, he uh, stresses on the importance of human life, the value of human life. And he says, one should begin practicing this Krishna consciousness, which is also called Bhagavat Dharma. That Dharma, which pertains to Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead should begin this from the stage of childhood, of boyhood, Kaumara. Kumar means, you know, till the age of five. So even in boyhood or childhood or girlhood, whatever, one should commence this um, uh, Bhagavad Dharma. Kaumara achare pragyo dharman bhagavatam piha durlabham manusham janma this Manushan Janma, this uh, human life, is very rare. And uh, despite it being so rare, uh, we should, and be or rather because it is so rare, one should take advantage of it. Tad api adhruvam arthadam. Because even though it is uh, rare, but it is full of meaning. Even though it is flickering, it is full of meaning and value because it is only in this life that one can actually attain Krishna consciousness. So, in this way, uh, Prahlad Gaur, or, or he explains the importance of uh, uh, the human form. The human form of life is not just meant for sense gratification, it's meant for spiritual development. And then he speaks another verse. Sukham aindriya kam daitya deha yogena dehinam sarvatra labhyate daivad 
yatha dukham ayatnatah he says aindriya sukha aindriya refers to the indriya indriya means the senses and aindriya means of the senses to sukham aindriya kam so that sukha or happiness that comes out of the indriyas or the senses or oh, daityas oh my fellow uh, demoniac uh, friends deh yogi na deh nam that which is uh, that which arises out of uh, contact with the body deh yogi na deh nam of those who are embodied that means those who have this material body sarvatra labhyate daivad it is obtainable or attainable anywhere and everywhere in all species of life by what daivad by the process of destiny so whether one is a bird in a bird's body or an animal's body in a worm's body in a human body whatever kind of material body one may have by one's destiny one will get a certain amount of happiness and distress yatha dukham ayatnatah just as one obtains um misery dukkha without wanting it it comes uninvited similarly the happiness of this world will also come uninvited so therefore one should not unnecessarily waste one's valuable human life and struggle for material happiness which will come anyway of its own accord human life is meant for attaining krishna consciousness but unfortunately people not realizing the true nature of the uh, act of sense gratification that actually this material world is a miserable place they waste their valuable human life in something as futile as this typically uh, human life may be of 100 years but 50 years is spent in sleep that is half the time 10 years passes in childhood when one is simply playing uh, or one in childhood when one doesn't really know what is what another 10 years in in later life in playing when one uh, also is not very developed in intelligence and the 20 years of old age are also uh, you know wasted in just ill health and so on so in this way 90 years of one's life are lost and the remaining 10 years are also wasted in all sorts of materialistic pursuits so this is a great loss a great tragedy prahlad goes on to describe the nature of family attachment which is at the heart of material attachment so uh, in order to enjoy the happiness uh, so called happiness of family life uh, one undergoes enormous difficulties and austerities and because it is not possible to enjoy sense gratification without money so there is also an increased tendency or inclination to accumulate money and then prahlad makes that famous statement for such people money is sweeter than honey prahlad maharaj used to quote that also so to accumulate money people go to all sorts of lengths they cheat uh, people around them sometimes they risk their life and they know that as a result of all these activities like cheating they may get punished eventually but yet they do it so my dear father please give up this oh my dear friends rather please give up this demoniac mentality and serve the supreme personality of god at krishna i have received these messages from the great devotee of the lord narad muni and he instructed me in this bhagavat dharma now the students his fellow classmates are curious but prahlad uh, you and i are of the same age and um, uh, you know we have been together learning from our teachers we never had narad muni coming here to teach us so then prahlad reveals the history he says when i was in my mother's womb uh, narad muni who was giving shelter to my mother he spoke the bhagavat dharma the shrimad bhagavatam to her she forgot everything but i who was within her womb remembered everything and therefore i have not forgotten and when i was born therefore these memories remained 
and these inclinations which I had acquired by the association of a great saintly person, Narad Muni, therefore I became, a, I was a spontaneous devotee of the Lord. And this is where we connect to uh, what I said in the beginning of my talk about being a born devotee. So the period of pregnancy is very important to create the right uh, impressions in the consciousness, which are called samskaras. So if the pregnant mother uh, engages in devotional activities and absorbs her mind and intelligence and senses in serving Krishna, then the child will turn out to be a wonderful devotee and will follow in the footsteps of Prahlad Maharaj. So then Prahlad continued his instructions. He spoke about how the soul is different from the body and how uh, those in the bodily conception of life are generally not uh, inclined towards obtaining transcendental knowledge. But in the human form of life, one must do that. One must indeed acquire transcendental knowledge, which is actually the knowledge of devotional service. So one must engage in the service of the Lord under the instructions of a bona fide spiritual master. If one follows the instructions of such a spiritual master, then one will attain the state of liberation from material bondage. And one will be able to take complete shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in this condition, one can actually attain perfection. And this devotional service is not dependent on any materialistic uh, process. It is not even dependent on dry renunciation, on dry austerities and penances and yoga processes and so on. So perfection of life is dependent only on purely serving the Supreme Lord. So this ends the fourth section of the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj. And then the fifth section. Now, when this continues, uh, for a while, and Hiranyakashipu keeps getting reports about how Prahlad is, quote unquote, to Hiranyakashipu's mind, contaminating all the other children. Now uh, he loses it completely. He's already lost it earlier, to use a colloquial expression, but now uh, it's beyond him now. And so he calls Prahlad. He's enraged. And he says, Prahlad, uh, by whose power have you become so uh, fearless and impudent? From where have you got your strength by which you are able to stand up to me? Even the demigods are not able to stand up to me and here you are standing up to me. Where are you getting this power from? What is the source of your strength? So Prahlad begins, the fifth section of his teachings. And he says, my dear father, the source of my strength is the same as the source of your strength. In fact, the source of strength for everyone and everything in this world is the same. That one supreme personality of God and Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna, whose influence is unlimited, who is the best of all personalities, and who is the source of the creation, the maintenance, and the destruction of this cosmic manifestation. Oh, my dear father, please give up this demoniac mentality and engage your mind in serving the Lord. Give up this idea of friends and enemies. Actually, the only enemy we have is our uncontrolled mind. So please cease discriminating between so-called friends and enemies. There are many fools like you, oh dear father, who made such distinctions in the past and they only had to bite the dust. So they did not get any benefit. So please take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, Prahlad concluded his instructions to his father, the fifth section of his teachings, and that was too much for Hiranyakashipu. So he said, okay, uh, Prahlad, now let us see this Vishnu whom you revere so much come and save you now. And he then cracks open the pillar or rather he, he, he uh, attacks the pillar with his uh, fist and 
the pillar cracks open and the Lord appears in a most uh, extraordinary form, which bewilders uh, Hiranyakashipu and all the demoniac people there. And eventually, of course, he, after fighting with him for some time, playing with him, toying with him, the Lord kills Hiranyakashipu. Now, Hiranyakashipu is in a state of extreme anger. Actually, he is the personification of anger. Now, if anybody can be angry, uh, it, when anybody is angry, we know how terrible it becomes, right? They act in, in such ways that uh, are not pleasing at all. But the anger that is seen in the material world is born of the modes of passion and ignorance. But the Lord's anger is always transcendental. But his anger was extremely fearsome, even to the demigods like Brahma and Shiva, what to speak of the lesser demigods like Indra, Chandra, Varuna. So they all try to appease the Lord from a distance uh, by offering prayers, but they were hesitant to come uh, anywhere near the Lord. <clears throat> Finally, they uh, approached Prahlad and told him to uh, go near the Lord and pacify him because uh, the, the anger of the Lord was something they could not look at. It was so fearsome. But Prahlad was fearless. <clears throat> and he went up and immediately Hiranyakashipu's anger fired. He looked very kindly and compassionately upon Prahlad and placed his hand upon Prahlad's head to bless him. And Prahlad became 100% purified. Whatever little traces of impurities that may have been, atomic traces were also cleansed by the touch of the Lord's uh, hand on his head. And he offered him beautiful prayers in almost about 42, 43 verses. So we don't have time to go into these prayers. And you can read that in chapter 9 of the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prahlad glorifies the Supreme Lord, offers him prayers. And when we study these prayers, these are also valuable teachings because the most uh, intricate and important philosophical truths are revealed through the prayers of great devotees like Prahlad. And then after he has offered these prayers, uh, Narsimha Dev smiles. He's very pleased with Prahlad. And he says, I'm willing to offer you any benedictions, my Lord. Uh, my, uh, my dear Prahlad. So ask me whatever you want. So Prahlad replies in a couple of verses, and he essentially says that, my dear Lord, uh, you know, I am not a merchant uh, who has come here to do business with you. Devotional service is something that is done selflessly. It is not done with the expectation of some material rewards. So Prahlad decries those servants who approach the Lord for some material benefit. Uh, just like any ordinary servant who serves a master, a perfect master, selfishly, is not a good servant. Similarly, any master who, who protects or uh, benedicts uh, the servant out of, because of a desire to obtain some prestige as such a good master is also not a good master. So the perfect servant is one who serves self, uh, ser one who serves the Lord out of complete selflessness with devotion. So uh, Prahlad is teaching us who is the perfect devotee, who is the perfect master. The perfect servant is the devotee like Prahlad. The perfect master is the Supreme Lord. This is the perfect combination. And still, Hiranyakash uh, Prahlad, I beg you, uh, the Lord Narsimha Dev, I beg your pardon, continues to give benedictions to uh, Prahlad. And he says, uh, you will enjoy a long period of life here. You will enjoy your senses and still you will be untouched by materialistic consciousness. At the end, you will come back to me. So the final part of Prahlad's prayer to Lord Narsimha Dev is, but please excuse my demoniac father. See, despite the fact that Hiranyakashipu had tried to harm him in so many ways, Prahlad was still kind and compassionate towards him. He didn't hate his father. 
This is the nature of a pure devotee. And now he was begging the Lord to excuse the offenses of his father. And the Lord, in the form of Narsim Hadev, replied, My dear Prahlad, don't worry. What to speak of your father? 21 generations connected to you will automatically be uh, delivered from all sinful reactions and offenses. So this is also an important point for us that a, a, a devotee of the Lord um, actually delivers his or her uh, generations, seven uh, previous generations, you know, and, and, and the uh, later generations as well. One can understand that to be also that um, seven generations of the previous births uh, of the current birth and also of the later births. So in any case, this was the extraordinary benediction that Lord Narsingadev gave to Prahlad's uh, you know, relatives. So being connected to a devotee is also a very glorious thing because one gets the benefit. But ultimately, of course, one must personally do devotional service. So with this, we conclude the sixth and final section of the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj. So as I mentioned earlier, because uh, we had only an hour and uh, we had so many chapters to discuss, I have only spoken it in a condensed form. So these are the teachings of Prahlad Maharaj, uh, the six sections of the teachings. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. The sixth and final section. So are there any questions? Dear devotees, please unmute yourself and ask any questions if you have. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, Dandavat. Uh, really happy to really happy to get your association after many years. I had uh, met I had gotten your association back in Bangalore a couple times in the Jagannath Mandir and in uh, a home program in Maleshwaram, but I'm so glad that you made it to Boston today. Uh, so really, really thanks to you for coming. Raj, um, I was just wondering, like, um, so every time we see uh, Krishna's pastimes and uh, he is killing demons, uh, there are different types of uh, deliverances uh, that uh, these demons got. And, um, when you say that in this case, um, that 21 generations of uh, Prahalat's uh, family members are delivered, what does it mean? Like, does it mean that they are going to, um, uh, they are going to, um, they, they are going back home, back to God? Or is it like they'll get another opportunity to become devotees and serve the Lord? Or how does it? Uh, what is it? How do we understand when you know some of these demons are delivered? Okay, so the question is, how does one understand uh, the fact that Lord Narasimha Dev uh, gave the benediction to Prahlad that twenty-one generations of his family members would be delivered? What does it really mean? Well, there are different types of deliverance. One may be deliverance from sinful life or deliverance from uh, life in the hellish planets or one may speak of deliverance from the cycle of birth and death or one may speak of deliverance completely from material consciousness and being situated in uh, Krishna consciousness. So now we understand that undoubtedly the relatives of um, a great devotee will benefit just because of their connection to that great devotee. So when we speak of deliverance in this way, we are implying that they will get a, some, a lot of purification, that we get purified from sinful activities. They will get an opportunity 
to take to Krishna consciousness somehow because of the good wishes of that devotee, because of their connection to that devotee, and because of whatever Krishna consciousness they may have done knowingly or unknowingly in the company of that devotee. So therefore, the deliverance here is not necessarily that the 21 generations will go back to Godhead. But the point here is that uh, certainly their offenses will be excused and they will get an opportunity to associate with devotees by virtue of which they can move ahead in Krishna consciousness and eventually become pure devotees. Okay. Okay, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so Any much. Any other question? Maharaj, if I may ask another question, because... Yes, yes. Maharaj, um, you were, throughout the class, you were talking, I mean, this question comes to me multiple times, but you were talking about, um, uh, you know, raising children in, um, uh, you know, raising children, like with the sole goal of, uh, you know, being Krishna conscious, um, or like saying that that's the, uh, you know, that's the, that's the goal or like that's the, uh, uh, you know, that's at the forefront of their upbringing. Um, but in any endeavor, we also see there is a mix of passion involved. Like, um, uh, you know, even when you're trying to bring up the kid uh, you, uh, in a very Krishna conscious way, like when you have uh, like, uh, you know, something where you want to, uh, you know, like where the kid is, uh, you know, you want to try to encourage them or do, uh, you know, something where they could excel or something. There's always a mix of passion, how much ever you um, try to keep Krishna consciousness in the forefront. Uh, like, I also wonder, like many of our, you know, everything that we see around our world, um, including, you know, like the recent vaccination efforts or whatever for the pandemic, all seems to be like a creation of passion. Um, and we as devotees are also accepting, you know, or like many of us are also accepting that one. Uh, like, how do we understand this? Like, you know, uh, and even when we look at Brahma's mood, it was, a little, you know, it is passion involved. How do we understand this whole thing? And how do we have the right mood uh, always? I'll try to. So if I understand you right, what you're asking is that uh, we are supposed to bring up the children in Krishna consciousness, but everywhere around us, we see the modes of passion so prominent. Uh, so what does one do about it? Yes. So yes, that is the nature of, material, of the material world. The modes of um, passion and ignorance are very strong, especially in this age of Kali. Therefore, uh, the, the antidote to that is to practice Krishna consciousness, to cultivate the mode of goodness, uh, because in the mode of goodness, it is possible to practice Krishna consciousness nicely. So therefore, to create an atmosphere at home uh, amongst the, in the devotee community and also in general in the society outside, uh, where we can... Uh, enable everyone to be attracted to and continue practice of Krishna consciousness. That is the, the way to counteract the modes of passion and ignorance. So similarly at home with the children, one has to give them what we call some scars or impressions and upbringing in which, which is focused on Krishna consciousness. Okay, so there's somebody else who has raised the hand. You may please... Ask, you may unmute yourself and ask. I can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. You can type your question, Mataji. 
maybe if you know, if you want to. In the meantime, if anybody wants to use this time to ask a question, please go ahead. So is your temple closed in Boston or is it open? What is the situation there? Um, it's closed, Maharaj. It's closed okay. for the public. Yeah. Only, only so we have, have a lockdown. Do you have a lockdown there? Well, city is not locked down, but um, it's opening up slowly. Okay. But there are still a lot of restrictions on uh, people coming together in groups, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, okay. Now they're, they're relaxing also. They're, it was in phases, now it's gradually relaxing. Um, it's okay. close now. It's closer. Yeah. Let me see if she is. To see everyone as an as not an enemy or a friend, how can we not? Uh, how can we see everyone as not an enemy or a friend? That's a question which Indulekha Madhuri asked. Okay, so the question is, how can we see anyone as not being an enemy or a friend? What is important is to note that you know because. It, such creations or such dualities are creations of the mind. Uh, they're based on the illusory effect of Krishna's external energy. Uh, what we think of as a friend is someone who helps us in our materialistic uh, life and fulfills our desires. What we think of as an enemy is one who obstructs that. So this is the criterion on the basis of which we create identities of friendship of friends and enemies. So the genuine friends are the devotees of the Lord who actually want us, who wish well for us, and they have knowledge of what it means to be the, uh, what is best for us. Uh, Krishna is the first and most important well-wisher and all his pure devotees are our well-wishers too. So the genuine friends we have are those who uh, are pure devotees of the Lord, Krishna and the pure devotees. And uh, so therefore we should, we should see it in that light. Of course, in the ordinary social dealings in the world, uh, when we see that people are genuinely wishing well for us, uh, then yes, we may consider them friends as such, but there is no need to consider other people as enemies. You may prevent, uh, you may protect yourself from them. Uh, for example, if there's a, a thief who wants to come into your house, you know, so he's acting inimically to your interests. So you have a right to protect yourself by locking your house and other, in, a, in other ways. Uh, but nevertheless, at a certain level, you know that that person is also being driven by certain modes of nature and that even though you will protect yourself and do what is necessary, uh, you don't bear any hatred or grudge towards that person. So that is the important point. And even if we consider somebody our friend, uh, like if there is a, a, you know, a, a political leader, for example, and that political leader's son commits a crime, then that leader should not hesitate to see that even his own son or daughter is punished. You know, it should not be that because there is a relative, that, you know, they are close to me, therefore I will protect them uh, illegally. No. So that is what it means. So essentially, when we become devotees of Krishna, uh, we will see everything in the light of Krishna consciousness. So, okay, I think I have gone over time. So we will stop here. And I wish, okay, yes, Raktak, yeah, isn't that so? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, uh, Hare so Krishna, Maharaj. you after a long time. Yes, Maharaj, please after accept Maharaj. Australia. Yes. Yes. yes Maharaj. Please after accept Melbourne. Maharaj. Okay. Yes. Happy to see you again, Raktak. Yes, likewise, Maharaj. So, so nice to see you after a long time. Um, Maharaj, I wanted to ask you, like, during this whole uh, Whole pandemic, you know, things have been, you know, fluctuating a lot of, uh, lot of uh, levels, you know, uh, 
work-wise, uh, at home, spiritually also. How do we, ma- and sometimes it's really hard to manage everything, you know, especially when we don't have, uh, you know, access to devotees uh, so easily and, you know, we're not able to meet them in person. Um, we can talk to them on the phone, but for some reason it doesn't serve the purpose. I mean, unless we actually in person associate with devotees, at least that's what been my experience so far. So I'm just wondering, you know, how do we manage this, you know, fluctuations? And sometimes it gets quite disturbing, you know. I mean, we don't know how till how many more days or months we may not be able to see devotees or, you know. So just so much fluctuation okay. everywhere inside out. How, how do we manage it? Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so your question is, I'm still repeating this because there are people on other platforms also like Facebook who are hearing it, so they don't hear your question. Yes. So your question is, that how do we manage the ups and downs that go with lockdowns and the restriction on people meeting? Uh, because it's very hard to be uh, without the physical association of devotees. We're not able to go to the temple and so on and other gatherings. So how does one manage? Well, yes, indeed, it is a very difficult time. And all the devotees are missing this a lot. Um, they're not able to go to the temple or to other devotional gatherings. I would say we look at it in in this way. Uh, Look at it positively also. Number one, Krishna is giving us an opportunity to realize how much we really are dependent on devotee association, on devotional gatherings and on the temple. Now, when we miss the devotees, we miss the deities, we miss the gatherings and the programs, we realize that uh, actually, yes, I was more attached than I thought to the deities. And if you're not attached, that it means if you're not missing it so much, that means you weren't so attached. It's a wake up call that I better become more serious in my Krishna consciousness. So, Krishna is giving us an opportunity to test our level of attachment to the deities, the devotees, to the holy name, and so on. So that's one thing. Uh, Second, also it's a test of our faith. You know, uh, are we going to give up Krishna consciousness or loosen our practice of Krishna consciousness because we're not getting the kind of facilities that we've been accustomed to for so long? So uh, this is the test we have to pass. And... Uh, despite the difficulties of not being able to go to the temple and to the devotees, we should continue our Krishna consciousness with enthusiasm. And third, many devotees have experienced that actually, uh, despite the lack of a physical association, they have actually intensified their hearing and chanting more than they did actually uh, pre-lockdown, pre-pandemic time. So they're able to hear many more lectures They're able to be and hear from a variety of sources now. Earlier they would hear from a few, but now they can hear from so many more. And there are so many lectures and programs being organized online. So actually it is um, an opportunity for intensifying uh, devotional service. And I would say a fourth reason would be that this is an opportunity for us to reflect on the nature of the material world and how it inflicts unceasingly pain upon the living entities uh, here. And we know this should give us faith that the only reality is Krishna consciousness. The only hope is Krishna consciousness. And we should therefore uh, take shelter of Krishna with uh, renewed vigor and determination. So I guess these are some ways in which we can think and that will help us to uh, not only cope with the pandemic, but also convert the adversity into an opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful class. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Hare Krishna. Let me know how you're doing. Raktak, it's been a long time since we met. Okay. Later. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, all right, all the devotees of ISKCON Boston, 
my um, warm regards to all of you. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to be with all of you and discuss Prahlad Maharaj's teachings. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah. On Prahlad behalf of Maharaj Ki Jai. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Gold Hare. Primanande. Hari Hari Bol. Hare Krishna. His Holiness Bhakti Rasanda Swami Maharaj Ki Jai. Jai. Dear Maharaj, um, it's a kind request um, from all of us at your Lotus Suite. Kindly consider uh, coming back again online whenever, you, if possible, uh, to give some lectures to Scon Boston. We are hankering for your association, Maharaj. So please, please kindly consider us. And also, when, when the pandemic uh, gets over and when things get uh, back to normal, please do consider visiting Boston, Maharaj. This is... Uh, a request from I, all the devotees yeah. of this Boston. I know it is, yeah. a, is a, but uh, please do consider that, Maras. Yeah, I cannot promise uh, a physical visit to Boston. If it happens, it happens. Uh, I don't know, I can't say. Um, but certainly at some point in the future, virtually, uh, I will be happy to be of service to all of you. Yes. So Maras, we are celebrating, Sorry, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary, installation anniversary of our deities, Shishi Radha Gopalava. These were installed by Shula Prabhupada themselves. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and that time we are we are, we, are, we, are, we are plan to have a, a month long program, and we are trying to invite devotees, uh, many sannyasis online. Uh, maybe we can. Can we request you, Maras, to like to be like one of the speakers and? Like, yeah. Sure. Uh, sure. I'll be happy okay. to do that. It, it's in the month of August. We have time. We have to almost like two, three months down the line. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Maharaj. Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Once again, His Holiness Bhakti Rasamrit Maharaj Ki Jai. Yeah. Okay. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah. Hare Krishna.